Hi, good evening. It's a concerned Dr. Miskoff, and it is August 4th, 2020. Uh, and uh, today I would like to go over a potential new therapy for COVID-19 uh, and potentially useful in the not only mild patient, but potentially the more severe patient. And uh, this was uh, something that came out. Let's see if we can get this rolling. Uh, RLF100, uh, the company I believe is Relief uh, something, and it's a Viptadil, uh, which is, um, if you look at the root here, VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide. Uh, so we'll go over that in a second, but a trial showed rapid recovery in COVID-19 patients. Um, this was put out yesterday. And they talk a little bit about what vasoactive intestinal peptide is. This is a normal, you know, over 20 sequence amino acid that the body normally produces, and it's it's a neuropeptide, if you will. Um, and what they found, and it's gone into a phase two and phase three trial, which I'll show you on clinicaltrials.gov, uh, but it's going to be an ongoing trial with over 200 patients. And this all came about because a VIP, um, or vasoactive intestinal peptide, I believe has been looked at in ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, at least in, in one study or is, is being looked at currently. Um, and may show some benefit with as an anti-inflammatory for sepsis or ARDS. So I think that's how that kind of got rolling. But there's been reports or case reports of this one was a 54-year-old man who contracted COVID. Uh, he, in fact, had double lung transplant uh, and was treated while treated for rejection of that double lung transplant, uh, came off the ventilator within four days of treatment with RLF 100 or BIP. Um, and then there was over 15 other case reports, and that's sort of driving uh, this phase two, phase three trial. Um, this is just another article pretty much with the same, Aviptadil, uh, uh, what they're looking at, uh, relief therapeutics, so there's the RLF uh, in that uh, there, uh, but looking at patients not only on oxygen, but also on CPAPs and BiPAPs and, and ventilators as well. So it'll be a range of patients with more moderate uh, to severe disease. Uh, again, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it says here, the drug was initially meant to treat patients with ARDS caused by COVID-19. Um, and you can look at clinicaltrials.gov. There are uh, three trials listed here currently, uh, two of them recruiting. Uh, this is the one that they're referring to, I believe. Uh, you can see the University of California at Irvine, also University of Miami and uh, Louisville, and four other sites are also listed there. So it's a multi-center trial. It is placebo control, I believe uh, double-blinded. You can take a peek into here as well. Uh, this actually states 144 participants. And you can see the inclusion criteria is COVID-19 and that they've been maxed out on optimal therapy. These are uh, patients that are going to be compared to uh, standard of care. You can see that here. And uh, infusions of, this is IV infusions of Aviptadil. Uh, mortality and uh, the PO2 to FIO2 ratio, what we often uh, what we use in the uh, ICU. And when that ratio uh, gets down, um, usually peri 100 or so, uh, we're usually um, proning these patients, putting them on their bellies so we can oxygenate them better with, uh, uh, oxygenate them better with ARDS. Uh, secondary outcomes will be TNF-alpha levels and uh, multi-system organ failure uh, free days. Kicking back to, let's see, the other uh, potential trials. This is the PB1046, and this is a VIP analog. So it's not a Viptadil, it's a different company, I guess, sponsoring this one. This is Phase Bio. The other was Neurotreatment. Um, and uh, this one's uh, labeled Vanguard Trial. Again, it's a sustained uh, human VIP analog. Hospitalized COVID patients, high risk of clinical deterioration and ARDS, so they're at risk of that. This is the one that has over 200 patients looking for completion date before the end of the year. 
And you can see this is a subcutaneous preparation that's given in three different doses. Um, and this is going to be a weekly uh, uh, injection sub-Q uh, in those hospitalized patients. They're excluded um, if their PO2 to FiO2 ratio is under 300. Certainly if it's under 100 and they're, they're getting prone uh, or on ventilation, mechanical ventilation, um, those are going to be patients that are excluded. So the inclusion criteria, uh, male or female 18 to 85 with COVID, they're getting at least oxygen by face mask or nasal cannula or prongs, or, uh, and, or they have elevated markers or cardiac injury like the troponin I or a B natriuretic peptide level. You can see that they're excluded um, if they're expected to uh, pass in the next 24 hours, if they're on mechanical ventilation or an imminent need for it. And there's other exclusion criteria as well. Vasoactive intestinal peptide, so this is just from Wikipedia. It's 28 amino acid sequence. Um, it does uh, have several roles in the body. Uh, it does state, uh, I read somewhere, that it can actually increase, even though it can cause coronary uh, vasodilation, it can actually increase blood pressure. That would be a good thing if you're uh, having sepsis or um, you know, on high dose sedation, uh, obviously, and low blood pressure could be for multiple reasons when you're sick in the ICU, but this may in fact have a positive inotropic and also increase your heart rate. Um, this product uh, uh, at least had been prepped for um, erectile dysfunction, uh, has an effect on the uh, hypothalamus and the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and you can look all this stuff up, uh, but um, uh, nonetheless, uh, this is some of the pathophysiology and information on just VIP. It says here it's a neuropeptide that functions as a neuromodulator, a neurotransmitter, potent vasodilator. You would think that that would drop your blood pressure, but I guess, you know, it, it depends on where and it, it's causing coronary vasodilation. That may be a good thing. And of course, if it's somehow increasing uh, inotropic capacity, that may help be helpful again in septic shock. And this uh, also goes through, you know, some of the information if you have a subscription to up-to-date. This was just the uh, free version, uh, giving a little information on it. Um, what they think that overall the vasoactive intestinal peptide does uh, is affect the type 2 pneumocyte. A quick review of that pulmonary alveoli or alveolus, um, where uh, the type 1 pneumocyte will be responsible for oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, that exchange that's going on uh, with the blood system or bloodstream. Um, uh, uh, where the type 2 pneumocytes are known for producing surfactant. Most of you have heard of surfactant. Uh, pulmonary surfactant doesn't usually kick in until the 35th uh, gestational age. So in preemies, you know, the, one of the goals is that the lungs are mature enough to produce pulmonary surfactant is to get them to 35 weeks of gestation. Uh, but the type 2 pneumocyte and that pulmonary surfactant is going to lower your surface tension. It's responsible for the elasticity of the lung. Uh, and then it can also differentiate and produce more type 1 uh, uh, pneumocytes or alveolar cells. So you need both, right? You need uh, air and oxygen uh, gas exchange, if you will, and you also need the production of surfactant, again, for the elasticity of the lung um, and to reduce surface tension. So a little bit of review on what type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes do and production of surfactant. Um, some have asked me, at a couple of uh, pharmacists asked me in the, uh, you know, when COVID was first kicking in, what I thought about giving surfactant. And this has, you know, been looked at, obviously, for uh, other uh, conditions in ARDS and kids and adults. And it never really got off the ground in adults, at least as far as the data is concerned. Um, uh, so this would be, an, uh, you know, I guess a way of uh, affecting the type 2 pneumocyte. But in reality, um, uh, uh, what it's probably doing is affecting the COVID virus itself and replication in that type 2 pneumocyte and potentially shutting down the virus in, the, in, that, in that cell, in those, in those pneumocytes. So uh, it's probably not having a direct effect on surfactant, but more of an effect on the virus replication in the type 2 pneumocyte if it is working, and you may get some secondary side effects. A VIPoma, you're producing these you know, tumors or something that's putting out a lot of VIP, 
uh, you know, I remember from uh, med school that, you know, one of the symptoms or biggest symptoms you'll get is, is diarrhea. Um, so I imagine that could be a side effect of this product as well. Uh, again, hemodynamics or blood pressure could be affected. I imagine either up or down, uh, but I haven't really looked at the PI um, uh, or insert on, on the product that was, you know, being looked at for erectile dysfunction, which I believe was a cocktail of VIP and something else. Uh, it's at least interesting. Uh, so far, you know, we have uh, Decadron, Dexamethasone, we have Remdesivir, we have Convalescent Plasma. These are the three that are, you know, looking to show positive data. Of course, Dex, uh, Dexamethasone for survival, Remdesivir uh, for shortening the course, but, uh, you know, looked at in moderate to severe, and of course, Plasma being given at, at different stages from admission, uh, depending on where you are, what system, and the aggressive, you know, aggressiveness of the treatment. Uh, younger patients that are really sick may get uh, plasma earlier on, and those who have a lot of comorbidities it potentially could be delayed. It just depends on the style of the treating clinician and availability. We've had availability, um, but this may be something else for that more moderate to severe patient. Um, again, we always uh, were thinking that you know you got to treat these patients early, uh, give them the hydroxy if it was going to work extremely early, maybe prophylaxis. Uh, again, there was a study that uh, looked like a sub-Q injection was given for the milder patient. Um, whether or not there'll be studies designed for prophylaxis and a sub-Q shot for providers, you know, you take a shot a week or, a sh you know, a shot uh, uh, every, every you know, two a week or something like that. I think the half-life is pretty quick with this stuff, so it would have to be some sort of, you know, sub-Q rather than pill unless you were taking it on a frequent basis, and I don't know if you, it's so easy to, uh, you know, make a synthetic uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide. Uh, in a pill form. Uh, I was going to talk about melatonin tonight, but decided to talk about a different uh, peptide or protein. Uh, we'll get to melatonin in the near future on a, on a blog. Everybody have a great night. Thanks for joining.